All right, so I'll keep the recorder handy there, and I can just record it or pause it whenever. So uh, the first thing is, I would probably not, I would probably not draw this graph until I have all the features in place. So I would just go through, you know, A through H, get all the features, and then if I can, connect them afterward. That's a lot easier than drawing something random and trying to fix it. So um, there's also one other little thing in here. It says function, so you'll have to keep in mind that the vertical line test is in effect. So you cannot fail the vertical line test on it. So that was actually why I made this problem out of four and a half points. You can get a max of four and a half. There are eight givens, and if you pass the vertical line test, you get your ninth half point. Okay? All right, so the first thing is f of four equals five. What does that mean? That literally means there's a dot here at four, five, and that's all it means. Okay, you can't take it any further than that. The next given is that the limit at four is three. Now, if you look in your notes, I told you that when the limit at four is three, it means both sides of four. Okay, not just a left side or a right side. So you need both sides of x equals 4. So this is x equals 4, obviously. And both sides of the graph are approaching y equals 3. So this teaches us that when you see a statement like f of 4 equals 5, that does not mean necessarily that the graph passes through 4, 5. It just means that the point 4, 5 exists. And it might be a loner, just like you see here. 4, 5 really exists, but he, there's no curve anywhere near him, say. Okay? All right. So do I know if the graph goes up and then back down like this? Not necessarily. It could come down and then down, which is probably more likely. We'll find out later. Okay. But anyway, uh, don't connect anything to that point four five. That thing is a loner. All right. One easy way to memorize that, one way to... Memorize that is anytime you see limb of whatever is whatever, that's just a hole. So you can literally think of this statement as there's a hole at 4, 3, and that has to look like that. A hole at 4, 3, I mean, what else could it mean than what we've drawn? So that's a good way to think of it. Um, f of 7 equals 0 means when x is 7, y is 0, right? So make sure you plot that over here. So you put that on the y-axis, okay? And here's an interesting fact. F is continuous at 7, but not differentiable at 7. So you have to draw through this point without lifting your pen, but you have to make it look sharp. So there are two ways to make it look sharp. There's corners and cusps, right? It just means that basically it's not smooth there. Okay, so it should be some kind of jagged kink. You know, like when you're using a hose and you're watering the lawn, and there's a kink in the hose, right? stops the water flow a bit. Yeah, kink in a graph is basically a point that's not differentiable. Okay, that's what that means. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3. Everybody drew that properly. And it says, this is very, very important. Don't miss this. The limit at negative 3 is infinity. Which side of negative 3 am I talking about? Both sides is implied here. That's really important. So I could tell that some of you didn't understand that when I looked at your pictures because you drew this going up here or you had one on the right, but you didn't have both, see? And you have to have both. Okay, so I might change my mind on how I want to shape this later, but so far this is what I've got. All right, then the next thing is the limit as x goes to negative infinity is 9 and the limit as x goes to positive infinity is 9. So that means that y equals 9 is a very important line and it acts as a role model for both sides of the curve. So the end behavior follows this line on both sides. Okay, so I think I'm going to go ahead and sketch this now in green. I'm going to make some changes here. I'm going to draw only in green. So I need this arrowhead going up, but I want to approach this line. So I'm going to actually draw it from coming from above and dropping down onto that line. So forget the blue under it there. Uh, the next side... This has to come down through, I guess, through the asymptote. Is that okay? Can we pass through the yeah. horizontal asymptote like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we can. You just can't pass through a vertical asymptote, right? So right through the horizontal asymptote, directly into this point, and then we find it's missing. Oh, well. And then we 
We'll plot this point here because it's part of it. And this is like an open hole. This comes down, hits the x-axis, bounces off in a sharp fashion, and actually rises then up to 9 maybe. Okay. So there are other ways you could draw this. Okay. But this is sort of the basic gist of it. Um, can somebody tell me some other variations I could make if I wanted to? Like, what are some things that weren't stated that I could change? Yeah, Catherine. Um, you could make the lines attached to the... Okay, so I'm recording again, and we've kind of played around with the graph a bit when I pause the recording. Let's go on to the second one. Okay, so these are intervals. I'm giving you intervals, right? This means between negative 10 and negative 2 in the domain, you see. And this means between uh, negative 2 and positive 5 in the domain. And this means between 5 and 10 in the domain. So it has nothing to do with the point negative 10, negative 2, you know. So you want to just think of the x-axis in three pieces, between here and here, between here and here, and between here and here. And you just have to design it where it's rising and then falling and then flat. So it's that simple, and you have a lot of flexibility here. You can just make it rise, fall, flat. Nice straight lines. Nothing wrong with that. I did say continuous, so try not to have any breaks in it. Right? Okay, then I asked you to use a pen of a different color and go over it again. This time, try to make it so it looks more differentiable. And so that just literally means more what? More curvy. You don't want to have any sharp turns, see? So maybe smooth is a good word there. You'll hear Matthew like to say smooth there. Okay, so my answer is going to be um, in green again for part D. Okay, so you just want to kind of round it out a bit. You want to design it where it kind of slowly flattens and then falls. Now here's the tricky part. You cannot change the fact that this is flat. Every single x value between 5 and 10 has to be completely flat. So don't miss this. If you're not paying attention, you're going to miss something important here. Okay, so I've been playing around with the idea of building a half pipe in my backyard. Okay, for skateboarding. Because I like skateboarding. And if the neighbors will be on board, I'm going to try and do it, hopefully. And if I can find the money. But I'm very interested in having about 10 feet of flat bottom. That means I don't want transition everywhere. It's not like a you know, pipe, it's, it's, it's a half pipe separated by a flat piece in the middle. So that's called the flat bottom. And I want 10 feet of flat on my ramp. Because it gives me time to think before I get to the next wall what trick I'm going to do. Okay? So I need 10 feet of flat. So the first thing you do is probably build the flat, keep it 10 feet, and then if you need transitions after that, you build outward from there. So the same thing is true on this picture. You can't change my flat. I can tell some of you are changing my flat on this. You're trying to make this curve and come in and you're just sacrificing some of that flat spot. You don't want that. So you've got to do all the curving before you get to that flat spot. So you're going to have to sort of get this thing flat, transitioned to flat, before it hits x equals 5, you see? All that transition has to happen before you hit 5, or you're going to sacrifice some of that flat bottom. And if the construction crew comes out and builds the ramp and sacrifices my flat bottom to build transitions, I'm going to be upset about it. Okay? So hopefully... They don't do that. I need the flat bottom because I'm too old to think quickly. All right. Uh, anyway, that's sort of an analogy to help you. Don't sacrifice the flat spots to form curves. Uh, let's go to this next one. This one you can kind of do the first one using the unit circle and the second one using your graph. So you need to know all of the graphs for the trigs, inverse trigs, any flash card. There's no reason why you should have any problems with limit problems if you have your flashcards memorized. I could do LNX and ask you, what's going on on the right side of zero there? Or, you know, LNX, and what's going on right over there near x equals 1, you see? Or e to the x, what's going on out there, you know, right near x equals 0, see? So you should be able to study all those tonight and get them all figured out, every asymptote, everything all the special features, you know? Uh, so for this first one, you're actually studying pi over 4, which really is just right in here. It's not a big deal. 
In fact, isn't the first thing you're supposed to do with a limit just plug this in? And if you get a number, you're done. And I get a number. What's 10 to the power of 4? What's 10 to the power of, what's 10 to 45 degrees? 1. That's the answer. Done. You don't need any special techniques if it works by plugging in, right? Uh, the next one is pi over 2. Now we've got problems. You can't plug in pi over 2. So you realize you're over here at this asymptote, and you're studying which side of it. What does the plus indicate? The right side of it. Correct. So you're supposed to actually be looking right on the right side of the first asymptote and looking at that arrowhead and ask, what's that thing doing? So what's it doing? Pointing which way? Negative infinity. That's the answer. So it's a very graphical type thing. Let's go to the next one. Uh, on these ones, again, the first thing you do is you try plugging in the number, and it doesn't work on any of them. So, but try that anyway on my test row. Maybe one of them, you just plug in four, and you get five halves, and you're done. You know what I mean? You should still try it first. I just didn't want my quiz to be too long. So you plug in four, and you get zero over zero. So you don't write anything. We don't know what to determine that to be. It's indeterminate. So what we're going to do is try some of our tricks. We have a conjugate trick. We have a factoring trick. Right? So let's try the conjugate trick. Multiply top and bottom by root x plus 2. And what happens is you get this problem instead. Remember, we don't distribute the bottom. We distribute the top. And this cancels out. Good riddance. Why is that good riddance? Now we can do what? We can plug in the 4 with no consequence. We get 1 over root 4 plus 2, and the answer is 1 fourth. So good job on that. Most everyone got that. Um, the next one is a little awkward to factor with that negative numerator, and the bottom says 3 minus x. That's kind of annoying. So why not just multiply this top and bottom by negative 1 even before we start? Nothing wrong with that. So now the problem looks a little bit simpler. And we get x squared minus x minus 6. And on the bottom, it's just x minus 3. And you'll notice you cannot plug in 3 at all. Don't plug in 3. It's not going to work. You can try, but it won't work. Uh, so you're going to basically factor the top into x minus 3, x plus 2. And goodbye, x minus 3. Hello, 3 plus 2. 5. See? So you can actually plug it in if you can get rid of the hole in the graph. See? You can find f of x if you eliminate the discontinuities. Now let's go to this next one. This one's spit in the ocean. How do we know? Yeah, you don't use spit in the ocean logic unless you see an infinity or negative infinity here. But spit in the ocean problems are very easy, technically. You just basically find the two terms that dominate the, the uh, fraction. Uh, you only get one choice on the top and one choice on the bottom, so don't get carried away. Only one term is most influential. So this problem literally becomes a simpler version of it. I need you to put away your cell phones and things because I need you to hear my expectations for showing work for tomorrow. This right here needs to be written with the limb. What I just wrote in blue has to be written. If you leave this off, what you're saying is that this problem is the same as this problem. That is not true. We're getting into the area where it's more like geometry proofs. Every work step you show matters okay, in calculus. That's where it kind of overlaps with geometry. You can't just write this somewhere on your paper. You have to write that this limit I gave you, this original problem typed, is the same limit problem as this which in turn is the same limit problem as this, which in turn is negative infinity. So it's a string of logic thoughts. It's, it's, your, it's your logic flow. You're saying, hey, look, this graph I can't really understand, but I know it has the same end behavior as the simpler one. Algebraically, I know that this reduces to this. And this graph is so simple, it's just a line or down, it must go to negative infinity, and therefore so does the old graph. See? It's a logic chain. And that's important to a math teacher to see your logic flow. So don't just write scribble, 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 negative infinity, done. That's not going to fly in my class. Okay, yes? Um, 
one is limit as x goes to 1. And some of you tried plugging in 1. That was good. You got 2 over 0, and you immediately concluded d and e. But that is not necessarily true. I can think of some cases where we would get infinity or negative infinity. Okay? Here's what I'm talking about. We know that x equals 1 is definitely not a whole. How do we know that? There's no x minus 1 on the top, right? No 1 minus x, no x minus 1. So that is an irremovable discontinuity. That x equals 1 represents a true break in the graph. It's not a missing point. So hopefully you realize there's a VA at 1. That's a start, but that still doesn't convince me that it's D and E. See, when you say D and E, I think the limits don't agree. Okay? So when you wrote D and E, I was like, oh, goody, they're going to show me that the two sides look different. But many of you didn't do that. You just put f of 1 is undefined. So what? f of 1 can be undefined, and it can be a whole. f1 can be undefined, and it can be going up like this. f1 can be undefined, and it will look like this. f1 can be undefined, and it can look like this. They all give different answers. It is not enough to say that x equals 1 is out of domain. So now you need to convince me that it's not this picture in blue. Okay, It's not this picture in black. Uh, like this, okay? You need to somehow convince me that it is basically one arrowhead up, one arrowhead down. That's the only reason I'll believe you when you say it's D and E. Okay, so how do you show that? You show left and right limits are different. So your work, all you needed to write was this, L-I-M, X goes to 1 from the left of F of X is infinity. L-I-M as X goes to 1 from the right of F of X is negative infinity. I don't even need you to justify it. Why is this better? Because D and E means this. D and E means that the limits don't agree. You might as well think of it as D and A. Do not agree. Because that's exactly what it means. So you need to show me that they're different. That's all I care about. Now why is the one on the left infinity? Because when you plug in 0 0.9 or 0.99, you're getting big positive numbers. Why is the limit on the right negative infinity? Because when you plug in 1.1 or 1.01, you're going to get a slightly negative number on that bottom, and you're going to get negative big numbers, negative 20, negative 201, and so on. Okay? So I, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the understanding, right? And then the next one is spit in the ocean, but you do it twice. Top, and, uh, You do uh, limit x goes to infinity, and then you do the same thing, limit x goes to negative infinity. So I do need to see two of these, and most of you remembered that, so good job. This will be the first calculus year I've ever taught where actually people did all the right steps on an HA problem. Next year is going to be that way. That's cool. So let's do this first one. Choose oceans. So which terms are the oceans? Yeah, the two exponential guys are going to dominate the polynomial terms, right? So what do we write next? The limit, right? remains the same. If you don't write the lim, you're saying that these expressions are equal to limits. It makes no sense. It's like saying cow is equal to pig. It looks horrible mathematically. This algebraically reduces to 2, and you can say what happens to the number 2 when x gets big? Nothing. The answer is 2. This is not the final answer. I didn't ask you for a limit. What's the question say? Horizontal asymptote looks like a straight what? Line. I want a y equals mx plus b. Don't I? Okay. So what I need from you is for you to write y equals 2. Why? Because it's a line. You see? I wasn't too strict on it, but I will be tomorrow. Answer the question. Right? Next one. Lim x goes to negative infinity. x plus 2 e to the x over e to the x plus 3x. Which terms are the oceans now? Yeah, it's the polynomials that dominate the exponentials. Uh, exponentials tend to shrink when you plug in negative numbers. Okay, They go to zero. So this then becomes the limit. x goes to negative infinity. x over 3x, which of course reduces to 1 third. And no matter what x does, 1 third is always 1 third. But we write what for a final answer? Y equals one-third. These are the two role model lines for that graph. One on the right, one on the left. 
The next one's pretty easy. Uh, you're just trying to tell me why you don't think there's any VA at 1. Um, there's no VA at all, in fact. The only discontinuity is at x equals 1, and it happens to be a whole. You can tell when it's factored. So what would you write to fully convince me? You would write something like this. x equals 1 is the only discontinuity. Right? It's the only forbidden value. And it's a whole, not a VA. Case closed. It is a whole, not a VA. OK? So since there's no other ones to look at, that's the answer. I'll record the last two problems or three problems later. They, they kind of differ anyway on number seven, because some of you guys created your own rational functions. I will not have you write your own rational functions, though, on the test tomorrow, because I know some of you wrote the simplest possible rational functions in the world. So I'm going to avoid that. Make sure you know how to do long division properly. OK, and then continuing on, I'll just take a look at number seven. You're supposed to write your own rational function. So what you're going to do is just make sure that there's a polynomial on the top, a polynomial on the bottom and you have degree 2 on the bottom, it says. So any quadratic will do. How about 2x squared plus 5x minus 3? And for the numerator, why not just do 3x cubed plus 6x minus 4? Let's make an x squared in this problem. So we'll do 3x cubed plus 6x squared minus 4x plus 5. You might say, I have a good reason for not doing that one, Mr. Short. It's too complicated. Well. Yeah, that's true. But what if I gave you this one on the test? Would you still be able to find the SA? OK, so let's be very careful with our long division. Put the divisor outside. The numerator goes on the inside. If you're missing any terms up here, like for example, if the 4x had been missing, I would have used a 0x as a placeholder. OK, so that's pretty important. But this is the problem I've chosen to work on. So what would you multiply 2x squared by to make 3x cubed? Well, certainly an x, and also a 2 thirds. So you would need to multiply by 3 halves, excuse me, not 2 thirds. So you would multiply by 3 halves x. OK, then you take that and you distribute it onto each term of the divisor. So you basically follow these arrows here, 1, 2, 3. And this gives us. 3x cubed, of course, plus, and then I have 15 halves x squared minus 9 halves x. And then this ends up getting subtracted because in long division we always do a subtraction on this phase of the algorithm. So we're going to subtract. Obviously, we get 0 for the cubic term. For 6 minus 15 halves, you could just think of that as 6 minus 7 and a half. So minus 1.5 x squared. So basically minus 3 halves x squared. That goes here. And then I have a negative 4, and you're adding 4 and a half. So that's basically plus a half x. And you can bring down the 5 if you want. But remember, we are going to stop after we get our SA. So we're actually so close to done, we might not need that plus 5 after all. OK, now we ask the question, what do we multiply 2x squared by to get negative 3 halves x squared? So basically, you're just going to multiply by negative 3 fourths. That'll do it. So I'm going to put a minus 3 fourths here. If you don't believe me, try distributing that negative 3 fourths into your divisor. 1, 2, 3. The very first term is negative 3 halves x squared. And there's a minus 15 fourths x, and there's a plus 9 fourths. But you know what? We're done anyway. We've already got our SA. Look back at the original work that you've been doing. Look at the top. You see there's an mx plus b right there. And whatever comes next is a remainder of sorts. And it will vanish as x gets huge. So we're done. The answer is y equals 3 halves x minus 3 fourths. Okay, the next two are more um, in inequality type problems. <coughs> Our book does a lot of inequalities. 
Uh, that's good. Um, this first one, you don't want to cross multiply because you know these inequalities will flip backwards. They will reverse themselves when you multiply by a negative, and we really don't know what x is yet, so we're running a huge risk of cross multiplying and that sort of thing and not knowing when to flip that inequality around. So forget cross multiplication. Let's bring everything to one side by subtraction like that and make it so that it's an f of x is less than zero problem. In other words, y is less than zero problem. So think of it as y is less than zero. Okay? Now, we're going to try to find the x's that make this statement true. So you guys did a pretty good job on this, except in the fraction com combination phase. So your common denominator is clearly x plus 2 times x plus 1. So you can collapse that. x plus 2, x plus 1. And the numerator is sort of a cross multiply sort of thing. You're going to multiply this up to here and this up to here. So you effectively get x squared minus 1 when you multiply this way. And you get x squared plus 2x when you multiply this way. But it's subtracted. It always was. There was a subtraction there in the first place. So just be very careful. This is actually x squared minus 1 minus x squared minus 2x, which really reduces to negative 1 minus 2x. OK, so it's really important you get everything organized properly. And my method of teaching this was to use a number line to solve it. There's other ways to think about it. But ultimately, a number line will organize all of your work for this two-dimensional graph into a one-dimensional question. So let's just look at the values of x that make this either zero or undefined. The values that make it zero are called roots. The values that make it undefined are called poles. And that word poles is not to be confused with the pole on a polar graph paper um, drawing, which is sort of like the origin, right? Okay, so what values make this undefined? That would be x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 1. And what value makes this fraction 0? You have to tell by looking at the top. Setting that equal to 0 would give you negative half. So you have to test these values. These are all open points. This problem is an inequality, a strict less than. All you need to do is really test one region. And since every, multiplic every root here is odd, um, odd multiplicity and the poles are odd multiplicity, you can trust they'll have changing behavior on each side. So let's just check to see if let's try x equals 0 works. So let's test x equals 0. You can just go all the way back to the beginning. Is 0 minus 1 over 0 plus 2 really less than 0 over 0 plus 1? And the answer is yes, it is. Negative 1 half is less than 0. So this ends up getting shaded because 0 is in that domain. And that's our test value. And then the next section over between negative 1 and negative half would not be shaded. That's because negative half is an uh, odd multiplicity root. And then the next region would be negative 2 to negative 1, and that will be shaded because negative 1 is an odd multiplicity asymptote. And the last one is negative 2. On the left side of that, you're not going to shade. So it's every other section gets shaded. So it goes blue, red, blue, red. All right, now let's go ahead and answer the question. We want to write our answer as an inequality. The x's that make this true are any x between negative 2 and negative 1, and any x bigger than negative half. So this is the answer, or you can write it in interval notation, which I'll write in black, negative 2 comma negative 1, and negative half comma infinity. Okay, now if this had been a less than or equal to, I'll do that in green. If this had been a less than or equal to, what would have changed? It turns out the only thing that would change is this point right here would fill in. What about the others? Why would negative 1 and negative 2 not fill in? And the reason is because those are out of domain. So they'll never get filled. It doesn't matter what kind of inequality we're dealing with. But that negative half could very well be filled if we had a less than or equal to 
type problem. Okay, the next one's a little bit easier, quite a bit easier. You just have to bring everything to one side and factor. So you bring everything to the left side probably. And this is sort of a y is greater than zero statement. Factoring it gives you x plus four, x minus two. The two numbers that would go on the number line are negative four and positive two. And both open again for the same reasons as last time. Because we have a strict inequality and testing x equals 0 gives us 0 squared plus 0 is greater than 8, which is false. So we would not shade the region that contains the domain value 0. That means we'll be shading far left and far right. So this basically goes red, blue, red. Red meaning the shaded and true region. Okay? And the answer is basically this. x is greater than 2. x is less than negative 4. And this is a disjunctive statement, so it's kind of an or thing, and you can do the same thing for the number 8a. And then if you want to put this in any quality or interval notation, the x is greater than 2 means anything from 2 to infinity, and the x is less than negative 4 means anything from negative infinity to negative 4.